Well, it's actually one of the hottest trends in business, starting a winery. Uh, thousands of people have taken out loans or invested their retirement accounts in new wineries throughout the United States. According to one trade publication, there are 7,116 wineries in the U.S. and 331 new wineries starting last year alone. So the industry apparently grows between 5 and 9% a year. What's behind this new movement of vintners? Did I say that properly? Vintners? It's a fancy word for winemakers. Well, according to the Complete Idiot's Guide to Starting and Running a Winery, even though the economy is struggling, uh, the wine market continues to grow. No matter how much money you have, you like drinking wine because it makes you feel like you have more money than you actually do. And with millions of baby boomers actually set to retire in the next few years, thousands of them are actually out there following their dream, starting a winery. Uh, Michelle and I, my wife and I, have met some of these wine entrepreneurs. We're not wine experts or anything. Uh, we specialize mostly in wine from Aldi. Uh, <laughs> which is remarkably good. I don't know if you had the wine from Aldi. Uh, but for the past few years, we've actually celebrated our anniversary out in Missouri wine country. Uh, those memories will have to last. That's one of the things we've given up for the capital campaign, so ouch. Uh, but regardless, we've been out to Stonehill. Anybody been out to Stonehill? Herman Hoff. We've gone to Adam Puchta and Robler and Sugar Creek and Oak Glen. I think that's us at Herman Hoff enjoying a nice stem of wine. Uh, most of these, we've gotten to know some of the owners and workers here, and most of the wineries were started in the 1800s by immigrants uh, who were impressed with Missouri's soil. Apparently, Missouri has some remarkably good soil for wine. Uh, but from our conversations with the employees, they all love what they do. They love being out in the country, love carrying on the tradition, love serving customers, perfecting their mix. If they can pay the bills, it's a dream come true. Now, the Bible tells us about another aspiring vintner who had a dream of starting a winery. Who knows why he did it? Didn't have very good chances of success. The grape vine that he started with was sour and puny. The soil was overrun with weeds. But despite that, he had always had a dream of starting a winery. He loves getting his hands dirty, using his vast wealth to bring joy to others. He's not exactly retired. But he is very old, very experienced. So one day long ago, he put himself on the line. He cleared the land. He planted the vines. He cultivated them. He harvested the fruit. Against the odds, it was going pretty well, too. People would rave about his wine from miles around. But then something happened. His dream of a successful winery fell apart in one dazzling, humiliating display. And although you might not much care for wine and might not think this tale of the broken winery has anything to do with you, the parable of the vineyard has much to teach us all about how to respond when your dreams are dashed and you don't know what to do. And I want to share with you the, sm the story this morning, which comes to us in a song from the Old Testament book of Psalms, Psalm 80. We've been studying some of the psalms in our current series here at Rooftop called Sad Psalms Say So Much. We're going to wrap up the series this Friday night at our Good Friday service uh, when we look at one of the saddest psalms in the book of Psalms, the one Jesus quotes from the cross. But as hopefully you've been able to see during this series, there are plenty of sad songs in Scripture. In the Bible, God doesn't just give us permission to be sad and frustrated and lonely. He gives us the words to sing as we're experiencing that. And in doing so, we learn to cope and commune and hopefully heal and grow. So this morning, I want to study with you a sad psalm I actually wasn't too familiar with before this week. But that's one of the great things about the Bible. It's so big, it's so thick, you never run out of new material. And over this past week, I've grown pretty fond of Psalm 80, a sad song about a people who lose their vineyard. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open, up, open them up there, Psalm 80. Hear us, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who sit enthroned between the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. Awaken your might, come and save us. Restore us, O God, make your face shine upon us that we may be saved. 
O Lord God Almighty, how long will your anger smolder against the prayers of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You have made them drink tears by the bowlful. You have made us a source of contention to our neighbors, and our enemies mock us. Restore us, O God Almighty. Make your face shine upon us, that we may be saved. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and you planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took root. It filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out its boughs to the sea, its shoots as far as the river. Why have you broken down its walls so that all who pass by pick its grapes? Boars from the forest ravage it, and the creatures of the field feed on it. Return to us, O God Almighty. Look down from heaven and see. Watch over this vine, the root your right hand has planted. The sun you have raised up for yourself. Your vine is cut down, it is burned with fire. At your rebuke, your people perish. Let your hand rest on the man at your right hand, the son of man you have raised up for yourself. Then we will not turn away from you. Revive us. We will call on your name. Restore us, O Lord God Almighty. Make your face shine upon us that we may be saved. This is what's known as a communal lament. To lament because it's sad, and it's communal because it's meant to be sung prayed together. The constant references to us and we remind us of that. Psalm 80 is also a good example of lyrics that quite obviously belong to a song. This used to be a song, not just a poem. We've long ago lost the music, but we still have the lyrics. And we can tell it used to be a song because there's a chorus that occurs repeatedly throughout the psalm, at the beginning, the middle, and the end. And if you kind of struggle with the lyrics, and you always jump in on the chorus, which is a little bit easier to sing. Here's the chorus. Restore us, O God Almighty. Make your face shine upon us that we may be saved. That chorus just keeps coming back to us. It occurs repeatedly throughout the song. There's also a context to this psalm as well. I mean that it was written in response to a specific period in Israel's history. And we learn this from the story of the vineyard in verse 7. The author of the psalm talks about the way God, their shepherd, brought a vine out of Egypt, drove the nations from new land, and planted the vine. He cleared the ground. The vine took root and spread. It filled the land. The mountains, the cedars were covered by its shade from the great sea to the great river. People harvested the grapes and enjoyed the choicest wine. What's the psalmist describing here? The history of Israel. Who's the planter? God. Who's the vine? Israel. Israel was plucked from Egypt and planted down in Canaan, the promised land. The land was cleared of enemies, the vine spread. By the time of King David's monarchy, the vine of Israel had spread from the Mediterranean Sea to the great river Euphrates in the east. For hundreds of years, Israel was the choicest vineyard around, the dominant nation in the region. But then something happens in the psalm. And something happens in history. The walls of the vineyard are broken. Its fruit is plundered. Boars ravage the vineyard. The vines shrink and shrivel. The vineyard falls into disrepair. What's the author describing here? the attack of the Babylonians and the Assyrians in the 8th century before Christ. The walls of Jerusalem are breached, its temple destroyed, its people killed, deported, and scattered. The vine shrivels up just like that. The winery is gone. The people, the grapes, are left wondering why. This is their question. Why have you broken down its walls so that all who pass by pick its grapes. This makes no sense to them. God was the one who transplanted the vine. He was the one who cleared the ground. God was the one who cultivated the vine, made it spread, harvested its grapes. This was his vineyard. 
Why would God go through such trouble to start a vineyard following his dream only to let it fall to neglect and be ravaged by boars? We know the answer to this question. The Bible tells us the answer to this question. God did not abandon his vineyard as much as Israel abandoned him. He plucked them out of Egypt, brought them, planted them in Canaan to build them into a great nation, and they responded to him by worshiping pagan gods, mistreating each other, fighting with each other, brawling with each other. As much as God loved his vineyard, this was not the dream. So he shuts up shop. Regardless of why God shuts down the vineyard, though, the why question is still one we're familiar with. We, too, are God's vineyard. We, his special people. As our lead horticulturist, it seems like God goes through a lot of trouble to build us, plant us, nurture us, water us, only to then let us suffer. It seems like one minute God is there cheering us on and assuring us of his love and plan for us, and then he's gone, leaving us to the boars. In the early days of Rooftop, for example, uh, I could tell that God was planting this vineyard. Uh, he had taken a small little vine, small, squibbly little vine, plucked it from Kirksville, Missouri, Truman State University. They had grown this small little vine up there. That's where the original core of Rooftop came from, Kirksville, Missouri. And he planted it down here. And God brought the vine to St. Louis. He cleared the ground, gave us room to grow. He brought people, gave us a great location. We met in the Richmond Heights Community Center. Anybody remember that? Old enough to remember that? We didn't have to even really find that. It just kind of came to us. God was just clearing the ground. I was driving around thinking, this would be a great place for a church. Like, Hanley 40. Everybody can come here. Wow. Wow, there's a building. What's that? Go inside. It's a new community center. Hey, can we meet here? Sure. God, just clearing the ground. God helped us raise money. God helped us find a niche. God brought us leaders. The dream was coming true. I mean, starting and building a great, life-changing church with some of your best friends in the world, what could be better than that? That's the dream. Starting and building a great church with some of your best friends in the world. That's the dream, man. And it was happening. But then the dream got hard. People started leaving. Conflict started brewing. Apathy set in. Stress took its toll. Our inexperience got the best of us. Supporters left us. People turned on each other. I remember one of the lowest moments in my life and ministry years ago when friends and coworkers were yelling and snapping at each other and arguing over what was wrong with rooftop. At one particular meeting, tears were flowing down my face as I saw good friends and church leaders bickering like enemies. And I remember thinking, this was not the dream. This was not the dream. The dream was to build a great church that radiates love and power to St. Louis. What happened to the dream? God, what happened to your dream? This is your church. Why did you abandon your dream? That's what I felt. Maybe you know the feeling. We all have dreams. Dreams of churches and families and marriages and careers, lives of significance. I met a friend for lunch this week who has been so gifted by God with skills and talents and abilities. God gave him a fantastic education doing a highly skilled trade, but he lost his job in the economy and for the life of him can't find a job and is working at a job he is monumentally overqualified for. What happened for the dream? God spent years preparing him for this. I know of way too many families that have dreams of children only to have their dreams dashed by miscarriage or worse. God spends months stitching together little lives in the womb, giving us hope and joy, only to see them pass along prematurely. What happened to the dream? I know of couples that were led together by God, found love in each other's arms. They were joined in holy matrimony, only to find that God seems to have left them as soon as they finished their vows. The difficulties of marriage were more than they can imagine. They don't know if they can make it. What happened to the dream? 
Life itself seems like one big dashed dream. God seems to work pretty hard to grow us as people. He feeds us, clothes us, educates us. He turns us into strong, reproducing human beings who make contributions to society. And then we get sick and die. Is that the dream? God spends an awful lot of effort growing us, cultivating us, only to let us suffer and die. Was this God's dream to give us life only to watch us perish? I like some of the language that the psalmist uses here in describing what's happened to the vineyard. He asks why God has broken the walls. He talks about grapes that have been plucked. Our fields have been ravaged by beasts. Our vine has been cut down, burned with fire. Anybody here feel broken? Ravaged? Plucked? What do you do when your walls have been broken, your grapes have been devoured, your fields have been ravaged, your vines burned? What do you do when your dream has been dashed? Well, you do what the psalmist does. You pray. You do the only thing left to do, you pray. It takes an incredible amount of courage and faith to pray to a God that seems to have just abandoned you, but what else do we have to do when our lives have fallen apart? We are left to pray. And far from being absent from our prayers, God gives us the words to pray as the chorus of a song that we can jump in on if we don't quite know the verses that well. And here's the prayer, the chorus of this song. Restore us, O God Almighty. Make your face shine upon us that we may be saved. That's the prayer that the psalmist just keeps coming back to throughout the psalm. Restore us, O God Almighty. Make your face shine upon us that we may be saved. When our vineyard has been destroyed, we don't know what to do, that's our prayer. And that's not just a prayer that the psalmist throws up to heaven, hoping God hears it, only to hear it thump back down on earth. That is the prayer that God answers. He already has. In the life of his son, Jesus Christ. And this morning, I want to look a little bit more closely at the lines of that prayer and how God answers the psalmist's prayer and yours and mine and the life, death, resurrection of his son. Starting back at the first line. Restore us, O God Almighty. It's the first line of the prayer. It's a plea for restoration, to be brought back to what once was. The memory of the vineyard in its best condition was fresh in Israel's mind. Restore us to that, they prayed. Make what once was true, true again. Last week I was at a baptism party uh, after the service. I was talking to Justin McCoy. I don't know if Justin's here at the first service. Justin here this morning? I think he might be a second service dude. But Justin's Rooftop's residential landscaping expert, he and his wife, Caitlin, are starting a new landscaping business. They're following the dream. And I was describing to Justin my lawn, which needs some work. I've got a hill in my backyard. It's muddy and eroding. My lawn has been overtaken by five types of weeds, which don't play well with the grass, most of which is dead anyway. Huge swaths of my yard have been dug up by voles. Do you know what voles are? Yes, they're burrowing mice. They leave pockets all over your house, uh, house, yard. They're heading for the house. Plus, the ground is uneven from erosion and fence posts have been removed and trees have been cut down over the decades and rotting stumps and ancient wood piles. It needs something, but I'm not sure what to call it. It just it needs something. And Justin piped in. He said, you need a lawn restoration. You know, what? You know, a lawn restoration. You've got to just get it back to where it was. I'm like, yes! I need a lawn restoration. It was not always like this. It's been a long time. At one point, I'm sure it was flat and green with grass. With spray paint. No vole problems, no drainage problems, but decades of neglect and misuse have taken their toll. That's what this needs. It needs to be restored to its original condition. And that's what this prayer of restoration is. God, take us back to what originally was. I hope you know, I hope you understand, we weren't created to live like this. 
We weren't created to suffer, struggle, and die. We were created to live perfectly in a garden. A garden with fruit and shade, with provision and peace. We see a glimpse of that ever so briefly at the beginning of time. Adam and Eve, our forebears, lived in that garden. We lived with them in their seed. That was the dream until it was corrupted. We forget that. We get used to our crappy lawns. It's just the lawn I have. Our crummy lives. We get used to disease. We get used to conflict, people dying. We get used to unexciting marriages. Well, this is what it is to empty faiths. Our first step in praying is to remember that this was not the dream. This was not what once was. Jesus came to restore what once was. He came to earth and set about on his mission to restore what once was. He came upon a a guy with a crippled hand. It's my crippled hand. He didn't just heal it. What does Mark say he did? Stretch out your hand, and he restored it. Came, Came upon a couple guys who were blind. Didn't just heal them. Mark says he restored their sight. He restores things to what they once were. This is what Jesus came to do, and this is his promise to you and I as well. Peter writes, The God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, I don't like that verse, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. I don't like that little verse. I don't like that middle verse. After you've suffered a little while. But I like that next part. Will himself, himself, he's going to do it himself, restore you to make you strong, firm, and steadfast. That's the dream. Let's not get so used to our shriveled hands, our crummy backyards, our mediocre lives that we forget we weren't made to this. This wasn't our dream. That's the first line of the prayer. Second is this. Make your face shine upon us. Uh, In the Old Testament, God's face was a symbol of how people perceived God to feel towards them and how they were experiencing them. If God had turned his face away, people perceived him to be angry at them. If God was hiding his face, people weren't perceiving God at all. And if God was making his face shine on them, they were feeling his joy and his blessing. The Old Testament Hebrews thought in images, and this was a favorite image of theirs. God's face represented their current perception of how things were going with God. And this makes sense, right? Your face radiates how you're doing at the moment. Uh, The other day, I was taking my daughter, Miranda, my four-year-old daughter, Miranda, to preschool. We got in a fight in the car on the way there. She wanted to listen to music. I wanted to listen to the news. I bought the car, so I won. And she got upset, started crying. Typical four-year-old crybaby. Wah, 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 wah. By the time we got to school, she had stopped crying, but her face was all blotchy and red. She does not cry well. She does not hide her emotions. At her, actually, these huge, big patches of red, like expanding beyond her eyebrows, just get blood red, and her cheeks get all flushed when she gets really, when she even starts to get slightly upset. You just see this big, this big eyebrow blood red thing. And she got to her class, and Miss Marcia, her teacher, could tell she'd, have a bear, she'd had a, a very bad morning. Oh, my goodness, what's the matter? You could see it on her face. It's the same way uh, Michelle and the kids can tell what kind of evening we're going to have when I come from home, when I come home from work, just by walking in the door. Most nights it's, uh-oh, Grumpy's here. <laughs> Everybody go outside occasionally. It's, wow, dad's home. He's in a good mood. Break out the Aldi wine, man. (laughs) This is a miracle. In Israel's experience, it had been a long time since God had come home with a shiny face. And Israel really needed him to. They needed his favor and blessing. They needed his face to shine. It's okay to pray this too, by the way. We all live at the mercy of God's favor. 
Our lives are determined by the expression on God's face. Our lives aren't determined by what we make of ourselves. Our lives aren't determined by what we make of our time. Our lives aren't determined by what sort of education we've received or how much money we have. The quality of our lives and our eternities are determined by what sort of expression is on the face of God towards us. And I don't know about you, but I really need God's face to shine on me. I need his peace, I need his provision, I need his power. The good news is, we know the face he's wearing. We don't have to guess what's going to be on God's face when he comes home at night. He showed us what's on his face. We live in the light of God's face. His blessing, his love, his grace shining brightly on us. God has shined his light on us in Jesus Christ. The Bible says this. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. God could not have shined his face more brightly on us than he did in Jesus. In Jesus, he gives us hope and joy and purpose. In the face of Christ, he gives us light and life. That's the second line of the poem. And the third is this, that we may be saved. The Israelites knew what they needed. They needed to be saved, saved from their enemies, saved from the Assyrians, saved from the Babylonians, saved from everybody else. That's what they needed. They they didn't need a new chemistry set. Didn't need a new chariot. They needed to be saved. They needed to be rescued. They were in an incredibly desperate situation, suffering at the hands of their enemies. They needed to be rescued, as do we. Their situation reminds me of my own desperate need for salvation. It's easy to forget how desperate we really are in life when things seem to be going well enough. I'm reasonably healthy. My family's doing reasonably well. Church is going pretty good. So what do I need? Legs kind of sore. Got some allergies in our house. Church needs a building. Is that it? Or do I need to be saved? I mean, if not for Jesus, I would be going to hell and suffering forever because of my crimes against God. And we need a building. We need to get saved. I mean, you've got to know what you need. Right? Reminds me of that silly charter internet commercial on the pirate ship. When the ship is being attacked by the Kraken... And the captain's trying to get everybody off the boat. Anybody know this commercial? The captain's trying to get everybody off the boat. It's being attacked by the Kraken. It's the really stupidest commercial. But he's screaming for everybody to abandon ship. One of the crewmates says, nope, I'm good. I've got charter internet. But it's the Kraken. No, I'm fine. 300 channels. It's really stupid, right? But really, don't we do this? If I were to ask you what you needed from God, what would you say? And imagine the position you're actually in. You're a sinner who has made tremendous mistakes in life. And because of God's justice, you have to suffer for those mistakes forever in hell. Were I to ask you what you needed, what would you say? Is that what you would say? I need help paying my electric bill. Allergies. It's really bad this time of year. My marriage is struggling. My aunt is sick. Church needs a new building. Need charter internet. All those are legitimate needs, more or less, but are they what you need? What does it matter to have a happy family in hell? What does it matter to have a church building in hell? What does it matter to have open sinuses in hell? Wow, I can smell the sulfur. (laughs) What do we need? Do we need those things or do we need to be saved? The psalmist knew what he needed. 
He needed God to save him in a very, very big way, a way bigger than he could ever conceive. Long after he passed from earth, though, God answered that prayer. When Christ came to earth, what did he came to do? He came to save sinners. That's from the Bible. And when you pray to be saved, God will answer that prayer. Paul writes in the New Testament, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that he rose from the dead, you will get cable. <laughs> no. You will be saved. So that's what you do when your dream is dashed, when your vineyard is overrun. You pray. The only thing left to do, you pray. You pray the prayer of Psalm 80 that has been perfectly answered in Jesus Christ. Restore us, O Lord God Almighty. Make your face shine on us so we may be saved. God has already answered that prayer for you and I. All the same. Let's pray it again. Let's pray. Father, thank you for not giving up on your dream. 